Ken Maya, thanks to the IHMC and the sponsors for having uh, the event tonight. It's a real treat <clears throat> to uh, get down to Pensacola. I had a 31-year career in the Navy, and uh, my dad was an aviator in World War II, trained here in Pensacola, and uh, my grandfather actually flew bombers as an Army pilot in France in 1918, and I grew up uh, really wanting more than anything ever to be a, a pilot, and of course a Navy pilot, because they're the best kind. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I really wanted to get to Pensacola, but it just didn't work out that way. And I ended up being a, a seal, a frogman. And uh, it, it, it actually worked out better. And I'll tell you a lot of reasons why. One of the highlights of my life was really two years ago um, with uh, my friend Frank Butler, another Navy SEAL. He and I were at the... Uh, Pensacola Naval Aviation Museum, and I got the uh, Naval Aviator Honorary uh, designation. And I don't know how many people here have served in the Navy? Probably half the room. I got to tell you and, you, and the people who have served know this, for the Navy to cross lines between the various unions, you know, to give a frogman a set of wings, it's, it's a really big deal. <laughs> so. I really enjoyed my time. Uh, I didn't fly till I was uh, at NASA in 1984, and I was there with about seven uh, other Navy pilots who were all new to the astronaut program, and we're flying these really, really cool uh, T-38 jet trainers. And these things are supersonic, and they're little, they're 800 mile an hour sports cars. I mean, they're just great things and so I got in the back and all my buddies in the front would look in the mirror and say hey uh, Shep uh, just sit back there we'll show you how to do this so that was how I learned how to fly and it was it was just a tremendous experience um, my career at NASA had a lot of uh, interesting aspects to it I flew in space three times and I really liked the the engineering challenges um, I didn't much appreciate the science at the time, although I was involved in some missions that had some pretty substantial uh, scientific effort. One of them was uh, Ulysses, which was a European payload. And the object of the, the probe, as it was, was to see the plane of the solar system away from this flat disk where all the planets are moving. And it's now in orbit around the poles of the sun. And the way that it got there was we shot it out. It went to Jupiter and kind of banked over the top of Jupiter. And Jupiter's gravity bent it down. And now it's orbiting over the top of the sun, uh, pretty much at right angles to the the, so, the plane of the solar system. And um, this is the only time that we've ever had to look at our solar system from any other angle than this flat disk that we see the sun in all the time. Another thing that happened that was really kind of uh, an interesting moment was uh, the, my third flight was on Columbia. And you, we had a lot of materials experiments and we had these big cameras and when you're not doing something, you're looking out the window and you have a list of pictures that people want shot of various places. So I'm firing the camera away as we're going over the Caribbean. And uh, when we got back from that mission, uh, about four weeks later, all the scientists and analysts go through the photography and you have a little show about what the pictures are about. And they flip one up and they're talking about sand dunes in Africa, or coral reefs, or Micronesia. And then they flipped up this one picture, and it was one of the photos that I took of the Yucatan. And uh, the researcher takes his little laser pointer, and he says, see these little holes here? And the terrain is all flat, marshy land, because there's a lot of limestone down there. And over the centuries, the water percolates through the limestone and makes these sinkholes. Same thing you've got a little bit east of here in Florida, you know, all the houses that in Orlando that are going, that's, what, that's, what, that's what's happening there. 
And this little line that this guy traced out was kind of a, a rim. And he said, this is uh, a rim. And what this is, it's the edge of the depression in the Earth's crust that the meteor made when it smacked into the Caribbean at Chikulub and killed the dinosaurs. And this is the first picture we've ever had of it. <laughs> cool stuff. So you do, cut, you do some of that, you know, I guess this, even, even a uh, uh, frogman like me gets kind of fired up from time to time about what happens uh, you know, from this vantage point that we have in space. So what I'd like to do, I'm, in a minute I'm going to show you a video of what it was like to work on the space station program, uh, train with the Russians and fly up into space for four and a half months. But <clears throat> before I do, I would like to have you guys think about questions uh, that I'll, I'll dwell on maybe after the video. Um, What's the space station about? You know, why do we have it up there? Uh, what is its purpose? What, what does it mean to us? Um, what's it like working with not only the Russians, but the other 15 countries that are involved? How does that, how does that come together? You know, how do you deal with the languages, the cultures, the computer displays, the customs, the you know, all that stuff? Um, the other thing that I'd like to think about is what, what does the space station mean in context for what we would do uh, at any time in the future in space? You know, does it, does it tell us anything? Uh, does it, is it something that we will benefit from? Does it, does it allow us to do more expansive things in the future? So I'd like the audience to think about questions like that as we roll through what uh, four and a half years of training is like and uh, nearly five months of flying in space. So let's go ahead and dim the lights and start the video and I'll narrate, if I can, what you're gonna see in, uh, I call these home movies from space. <laughs> this is our uh, patch, Yuri Gidzenko, Sergei Krikalev, and myself. And this little icon for the space station. Here we are uh, in our training we did about two-thirds of our training in Moscow and about a third in Houston. Here we're in Houston. Sergei is getting into a Russian spacesuit that we would use for a spacewalk outside. And uh, Yuri's getting in another one. And I'm going to put on a U.S. spacesuit. We're all going to go to the bottom of the pool. And we're going to practice if we had to go outside in an emergency and the white stuff is all the space station, uh, we would be floating around using tools and hooking things up to deal with a contingency. And this is how we train to get ready. Yuri and I are now in Moscow, and this is a simulator that's the shape of the Soyuz capsule. And this capsule is what we go into space in, and it's also our lifeboat. If we need to come down in a hurry, we jump in this thing, close the hatch, and come down. And we're practicing uh, an emergency re-entry or something there. I don't know exactly what that was. Survival training, this is again a boilerplate capsule mock-up, and we're in the Black Sea, and we're practicing water survival so that if we come down unexpectedly, we're probably in the ocean somewhere, and we've got to signal the rescue forces to find us and come pick us up, and that's what we're doing there. Uh, there have been several instances where Russian crews <clears throat> coming back from their missions have landed out in the woods somewhere, and uh, we got a little survival training in uh, the training area around uh, Moscow. <clears throat> when I, I was a SEAL for about half my career, and this is kind of like, I did a lot of professional camping, and this was kind of fun. <laughs> so our flight uh, took off in the fall of 2000, but in 19, October of 1998, the first piece of the station went up, and you see it's at, at the top of that white rocket there. It's called Zarya, which means sunrise. A uh, month later, the space shuttle went up with the first US piece. That's Zarya right there. And they're going to dock the two together. We're kind of building, putting the building blocks up in space to get things started. 
This is Sergey who got, he got a twofer. He got two rides out of one mission. We put him on that flight with a shuttle to open up the, uh, the door on Zarya. Yuri and I are in the, the secret rocket factory. This used to be the Tupolev bomber plant in the Cold War. We were in there almost every day for the last six months of our training to get the third piece going up there called the service module so we had enough room so we could live on board. The run up to our launch had a lot of ceremony to it. We're at Red Square, we put flowers on Gagarin's tomb and then we get ready to go down to Baikonur where this is in Kazakhstan which is where all the launches take place. And the white thing in the back is the shroud over our capsule. And in the launch complex, there's a museum where 50 years of Russian space history is all chronicled. And it's a pretty awesome place. I mean, the Russians are incredibly proud of the things that they've done in space. And a lot of them they've done really well. And it's all in there. We signed a few photos. And uh, the real highlight was next door, though. This was the cabin that Yuri Gagarin lived in in 1961 before he was the first human to go into space on April 12th. Our rocket was essentially the same machine pretty much that Yuri flew with some changes to it, some mods to it, but basically the same rocket. Three days before our launch, the Russians rolled the rocket out with the capsule on top of it at the end there. And it goes out into the desert. It's kind of foggy. October, goes up on a big hydraulic launcher over the launch bed. Our launch was the 407th launch from that launch pad without a single failure. <coughs> we get up uh, October 31st, early in the morning. Everybody signs their name on the door. We get a little uh, religious uh, freshwater wash down here. <laughs> Then we go down to the launch area and we put our pressure suits on, which is a safety measure when we're in the capsule. And Yuri's going to fly the Soyuz rocket to orbit. He salutes the, the head of the launch complex and we get on the bus. Now, you got to remember, we're at the base of about 3 million pounds of fully fueled rocket with a lot of stuff in there ready to go boom. And there are 400 people right at the base of where we're at. And uh, half of them are drinking and the other half are smoking. <laughs> <laughs> if, you went to, if you went to Cape Kennedy to see this, you wouldn't see another human within five miles of that launch pad. You know, there's 400 people right there. So here's the launch going off uh, 10.30 in the morning. It's a liquid uh, first stage, so it takes a little time for the engines to spin up, and they're up to speed, and the, the restraints are going to let go, and, and we're, in, we're, we're moving out. And it goes right, right into a full overcast. There is no way Houston would have launched that day. It just wouldn't have happened. <laughs> so here we are in the capsule. It's really tight. It's about the size of a Honda Civic inside, three guys. We're in our suits, and we're being pressed back into our seat with three times the force of gravity, or we say three Gs. And you'll see I'm holding a little camera, waving it around. That's an onboard camera we switched to. But uh, I'm panning the, the video camera around a little bit. You'll see some bumping and then a thumbs up, and that's... That's me giving a high sign because we're at the end of our powered ascent and we're high enough and fast enough we're going to stay in space and we're, we're damn glad to have that all done. <laughs> and so uh, we've got to wait in the capsule for about an hour and a half till we get back over Moscow again. They want to look at the telemetry and make sure nothing's leaking and then we get the go to get out of our suits and uh, just start getting on with life. Here we are about three or four hours later, and we've left the 
the Soyuz capsule, we're in a living module that sits above that. And you can see we're starting to look like little pumpkins. And that's because all your fluid in your lower body isn't pulled down by gravity anymore. So your neck and your face get kind of full. And uh, that lasts a couple days and a few trips to the bathroom and you're back to normal. <laughs> Yuri's sleeping in the middle down there. That's his couch. And Sergey's waving the video camera around to show you a little bit about what this living module looks like. And, and why do we have to be here? Well, we're in the same plane going around the Earth behind the space station, but we're under it and behind it. And it takes us about a day and a half. Each orbit, we catch up to it a little bit, and we have this sequencing going on where every hour we get a little closer to it so two days later we're ready to dock with it this is me sleeping against the uh, the bulkhead there so here's our home this is where we're going uh nobody there yet and we're gonna close in on the back of it and dock you'll see that in just a second there's a little radar going on we're about maybe a mile away from it we're gonna slide right in that disc in the upper left there you can see the square things going out to the side, the rectangles, there are big solar panels. Here's the video, the TV downlink from Moscow, and our docking is in that cone at about 11 o'clock there. And there's some sound here if you can hear it. Yeah, hear the words, yes, kasanya, yes, soydininya. It means contact in Russian. Let's look upon this as the real opening of the international space frontier, not just for a country, but for Russia, America, Europe, Japan, Canada, and all that are to follow. That was the first afternoon that we docked aboard, and it was a very long day. This started uh, several months of putting pieces of the station together that were inside. And we were all very hands-on guys, so this was kind of like tool time, and we, we really enjoyed this part of the mission. <coughs> Yuri's talking to Moscow, and you can see the screens in the background. We use little laptops, and that was our primary interface to control the station. And you can see lots of bags and things. We're just like chalk. It's like being on a submarine. As a matter of fact, the gold thing on the right was a submarine barometer. That's what the Russian submarine forces use to say what pressure they have inside. Here's an unmanned progress ship coming up. And this is the first one, and Yuri had to take command of it because its radar system was getting a little confused about where we were. So we cut that off, and Yuri flew it in by hand. We've got the hatch open, and we're opening a couple valves to let oxygen inside. Good thing to have when you're up in space. <laughs> and then uh, mid-December, the, uh, the first of three shuttles came up. I believe this is Endeavor, and they're putting up a large solar array. We use the sun to uh, crank up the arrays, and we... We use some of the electricity and we put the rest in batteries when we're in darkness. And this is how we keep things powered up in orbit. Each array is about 25 kilowatts, which is enough for several houses here on Earth. We've got four big sets of arrays on the station now, over something like 110 kilowatts of power. You could, you could run a couple, couple blocks of houses with that. So here was the uh, solar array after it got up. The crew requests permission to come aboard. Endeavor permission granted. Captain <laughs> Captain Brent Jet, U.S. Navy. Any Air Force people in the crowd? I got news for you. We're going to be doing this in orbit for about the next 1,000 years. <laughs> So Endeavor pulled away, and we got a chance to settle back down to work. And again, it was more fixing things. Sergey's, <laughs> Sergey's diving in a pile. We got a, we got a bad cable in there. He's trying to fix that. 
Exercise turns out to be a very big thing when you're in orbit. There's a treadmill, a bicycle, and a, a jungle gym thing that I'm on. And this is, turns out to be fairly key in keeping your bones uh, as dense as they are on the ground. And we think it has something to do with what elderly women experience with osteoporosis, and it's a big research area right now. The highlight of the day was getting at the food. Uh, here's part of the galley, and Sergei's making a Russian soup. <laughs> and uh, you wouldn't think that the Russian food was very good, but I really liked it. And ever since Napoleon went through Moscow, their food isn't bad. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and you, 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 know, you probably don't know, but the word bistro, which is a little cafe, it's actually a Russian word, and the, the Russian waiters were trying to take care of the French soldiers in Moscow, and all the French soldiers knew was to scream at the servants saying, faster, faster, and they said, bistro, bistro, and that's what a bistro is. <laughs> Sergei's uh, having a little tea there, and I also find it amazing that the human body is so adaptable. You know, it does not care that you're drinking your bag of tea upside down. I mean, <laughs> you, you, somehow it all goes the right way. <laughs> January, uh, this is Atlantis coming up, and it's the centerpiece of the U.S. part of the laboratory, a school bus-sized uh, module that's built to take uh, about 25 racks of experiments. And this is a billion dollar piece of hardware here. The shuttle's gonna put it uh, to the station with its robotic arm. Uh, Tom Jones and Bob Kerbeam, two astronauts, are gonna go outside, uh, finish the mechanical connections and hook up all the plumbing and the wiring and then we can turn the, the lights on in the lab and have uh, air conditioning and power and everything that we need. I'm inside with a golf shirt on. Bob Kerbeam is outside minus 150 degrees total vacuum. I mean, just the contrasts that you see when you're doing this are just quite amazing. So I'm inside the lab, and uh, this is the last time it looked pristine like this. It is full of stuff now. Put experiment racks in, and forward you'll see the hatch where the shuttles will be docking in the future when they come to visit Alpha. This is an app code that's been signed by all the folks who worked on the lab and um, it is in the lab. They should be very proud of it. We're proud of it. We're going to bring that home so that they can display it down at the Cape. Look in the window. Atlantis departing. Sadly. Sadly, Sadly is right. Have a good trip. Okay. Thank you. These are the shuttle crewmen that are going through the hatch that connects the two vehicles, and we're going to close the hatches up, evacuate the gas between them, and the shuttle's going to undock. And uh, Marsh Ivins, one of my classmates from 1984, class of astronaut candidates, it's really hard. These people are all going to be uh, down in Florida drinking margaritas in about a day and a half, and we're up, you know, we're working. <laughs> Sergey talking to Moscow. You can see the cabin behind him. That's his uh, sleeping bag and his sleep station. And uh, the docs were quite concerned that we give each other some sort of medical checkup every month. And I'm trying to find Sergey's liver, or Yuri's liver. And Sergey's joking; he doesn't have one anymore. <laughs> we're measuring Sergey's mass on a little pendulous thing there. Every couple of days, we have to take the trash out, and we use the cargo vessel uh, both as supply and, and trash. And when it's uh, full to the gills, we, we tie everything down the bilge, we undock it, it goes into the upper atmosphere and burns up. March of 2001, uh, Discovery, our third shuttle, is coming up. Two primary things, one to dock a big logistics module, uh, built by the Italians, and this is how we move big things back and forth in space from the ground to the station. 
And I'm opening the, uh, the door to get into the logistics module for the first time. And you can see it's, it's going to be pretty big on the inside. Second mission uh, that Discovery had was to swap crews out. And this is some of the second crew here moving cargo around, helping us configure. Jim Voss, one of the members of Expedition 2, he's, he's moving an object that's bigger than your refrigerator, and he's doing it with two fingers. <laughs> and accounted for. Change of command is an ancient naval tradition. The passage of responsibility for mission, welfare of crew, and integrity of vessel from one individual to another. Space Station Alpha has been commissioned in orbit. The service module has been activated. The power element and laboratory module have been brought aboard. A successful resupply mission with Discovery and her crew is complete. Station is at normal condition. All systems functional and ready to carry out operations. We are on a true spaceship now, making our way above any earthly boundary. We are not the first crew to board Alpha or the last to depart, but we have made Alpha come alive. We gave her a name and put substance to the ideas that our crews can work together as equals and our countries as partners. That we may proceed with bolder and more enterprising voyages in space with benefit from our differences and with a stronger purpose in our common goals. We pass to your care Alpha's log with the hope that many successful entries here are recorded that explorations are prodigious and discoveries wondrous. May the goodwill, spirit, and sense of mission we have enjoyed on board endure. Sail her well. I am ready to be relieved. And I relieve you. Yuri Yusuchev, uh, Russian cosmonaut, first change of command in space ever. They do it about every six months now. As a matter of fact, Koichi Wakata, Japanese astronaut, today is in command of the space station. Had a chance to see how the station had grown while we were up on orbit. A day and a half later, the crew of Discovery brings us back to the runway at Kennedy Space Center. Great landing about 2 o'clock in the morning. Touchdown. Kelly will be deploying the drag chute a moment from now. Discovery rolling out on runway 15 at the Kennedy Space Center, wrapping up a 5.3 million mile mission, bringing home the first residents of the International Space Station after four and a half months in orbit. We take uh, about an hour to climb out of our suits. We jump in a transport van and we go back to the Kennedy Space Center. Then the next day, we get up and uh, get hauled back to Houston, where all of our training in the States, for the most part, took place. And the uh, mission was controlled from, but it's also the home of the management team that coordinates and organizes all the space station program activities. So we had a chance to meet with the, uh, the NASA and Russian uh, leadership there. One of the highlights was to uh, go into a large airplane hangar here. It's my wife and uh, the, our two dogs. <laughs> and uh, they hadn't seen me for about eight months, and they hadn't seen my wife for about a week, but they're all over her because she feeds them. <laughs> we had. Uh, quite a bit of uh, speeches and ceremony, and it was just a, a great chance to catch up with uh, the thousands of people that helped put this all together and make it work. And then afterwards, we had some time to uh, get up and close with other astronauts and friends who were really essential to, to getting our flight uh, off the ground and have the mission be a success. Yuri and his uh, two sons there. 
And I was trying to see if my dogs could figure out who I was. <laughs> they, they, they finally got the picture. And that was our mission. Let me answer a couple of my own questions first, and then we'll take some from the audience. Um, what, what's the big deal about Space Station? Why, why was it built? Why do we have it? What's it going to do? Uh, President Reagan started the Space Station program in 1986, and we almost lost it in Congress in 1992 with the change of administrations uh, when the Clinton administration came into town. And uh, it was decided then that if we're going to have a space station, let's broaden the aperture for the partner nations and see if the Russians would be interested to participate. This was a very propitious thing because Russia was about two years past the wall coming down and the Soviet Union coming apart. And we had all these Russian scientists running around looking for things to do. And if we didn't do something with them, they were going to go to places like Iran and North Korea and teach those guys how to build rockets. So we cut a deal with the Russians and we said, OK, uh, if we will contract with you to build some pieces of the station and, and pay you to do that. And that was really the genesis of how this evolved. Um, and so what does the station mean? Well. Beyond all the political drama, we have a, a research platform in space that we've never had before. And I worked on my second shuttle flight on something called protein crystal growth. And the flight was uh, fairly short, and we had a drawer full of uh, solution that dried out in space and formed crystals when it did so that people could analyze with x-ray machines back on Earth. And we'd say, OK, well, why do you want to do this? When we try and understand how to develop new drugs, we are looking to find uh, just compounds that take the shape of the, of the individual protein that we're trying to affect, <clears throat> and basically to inhibit the protein from coming apart and, and replicating. And that's what, in large part, that's what drugs do. But in order to build the drug molecule, we have to know what the protein that we're trying to affect looks like. And the only way we have that's a, at all reasonable to do that is by growing a crystal, which is that protein multiplied thousands of thousands of times over. So we have something big enough, even for an x-ray machine, to shoot at it and get a little picture of what this thing looks like. <coughs> When I flew in 19, this was 92, when we flew that experiment in 1992, the structure of 500 proteins, more or less, was known on Earth. Over 130 of those had been, uh, the structure had been analyzed from crystals that were grown in space. We, we did that for two weeks, and we got very modest results. Space Station could do that same research in an afternoon. That's what the difference in capacity is. And it's Earth science, it's space science, it's materials, it's biology, it's life sciences. It's a whole raft of things. And that's why having access to a space station is important. But I think the bigger message is right now we have uh, three people who are living on this place that's not part of Earth anymore. Sure, they can look out the window and 250 miles down below them, they're going past the spinning globe that's the Earth. But they're not living, they're not living on the planet anymore. And if you ask them, that's what they'd say. They'd say, well, you know, we're, we're actually looking, we're feeling like we're not residents of Earth anymore. That, not residents of Earth anymore. That's what's really important. Who knows here if we would go back to the moon? Anybody? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a guess. I'd like to see us go back to the moon. Or w what, what day will it be when maybe our children or our grandchildren go to Mars? 
Who knows? Nobody knows. I do know that it's going to take very exceptional capability to have people travel to these places and sustain themselves and be able to live and work in these environments. Space Station is the tool we're using now to figure out how to do that. That's why it's important. Um, I think I'm kind of at the end of the answers to my own questions, so I, I think we got time for a few from the audience. But please raise your hand, wait for the mic, and this, this gentleman right here has been bugging me for five minutes to, to <laughs> get the mic. Uh, this is kind of a personal thing, but it sure would bug me. What kind of a problem was it up there in space with a gravity such as it was when you had to pee and poop? Actually, it, it, it's a pretty good question because it's a lot like what you would find on a boat or a camper. And the only difference is you have to get yourself so you're not moving around. And you have to turn a fan on that provides airflow so everything goes the right way. <laughs> and uh, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, you know, <laughs> the, Russian, the Russian toilet is really good. The Russians build some really, it's industrial strength, agriculture, hardware. But when the chips are down, it works. And that's what you want. But I would get up in the morning once, and it happened to me twice. I'd get up, and I, I'd roll out of my sleep quarters, and the head, the toilet, was right nearby. And I would really have to urinate really bad. And so I'd be sitting there, and I'd be urinating in this big funnel. And all of a sudden, I, I would, my midsection was getting kind of damp, and I'm going, what's going on here? <laughs> And I look down, there's this huge puddle of urine just blobbing out because I forgot to turn the fan on. <laughs> but you, probably more than you want to know, but, but <laughs> you got to have a sense of humor about this. I noticed you blasted off several times in the, in the Russian rockets. Uh, like our government, were they all supplied by the lowest bidder? Well, the, the, Russian, the Russian system for building things is kind of hard to decipher. Uh, I don't think they have the same relationship with industry that we have, where we have this very competitive, open process. They do compete company to company, but you don't see it done in the open like we do. Um, and I've got to tell you that the Russian hardware uh, is, is kind of built to a different culture. Uh, in the shuttle, if you have three big liquid engines that propel you for the last three quarters of your flight to orbit, if you lose one of those engines early in the flight, you probably, you, you're not going to get to space. And you, you may be in the water if you can't find a runway that you can get to, which, off, which can occur. And so when that if you have an engine that goes down, you take the other two and put them to max power. But you can, you can run them in a regime which is beyond what they've been tested to. So you never know if that engine's going to hang in there or not, or you're going to make the problem worse. So it's, you know, it's the ocean or putting a strain on the engine. That's because we don't test our engines to failure because it's very expensive. The Russians, on the other hand, they blow up rocket engines all the time because they want to know, based on picking through the pieces, what gave way. So when they're flying, they know what margin they have. They know what reserve performance they can ask. And it's a whole different way to look at hardware. And if you, if you had the money, you'd probably do it that way, too. There's a question way in the back. The guy in the tie and the shirt. How stable is the orbit of the space station and how long before it will need to be either boosted up or sped up or slowed down or whatever to remain in orbit? The, uh, the orbit is about, it's, it's purposely high enough so the, or, the, 
the amount of drag that you have from particles that get stripped off from the atmosphere is fairly low. And that, that altitude's <coughs> a little over 200 miles. Uh, right now, the space station comes down somewhere between 150 and 200 yards in altitude every day because it does have drag. And it's very small, but it doesn't take much to change the orbit. If the station got down below 100 miles in altitude, it'd be big trouble because it would be, it would deorbit in a matter of days below that altitude. So we want to keep it, keep it high. So every time we have a cargo vessel coming, we either burn the engines of that cargo vessel to push up the station a little bit, or we move the fuel from the cargo vessel into the station and burn the station's engines when we have to to push it up a little bit. Very interesting experiments on the books, though. <coughs> We're going to try and uh, build a, a very unique uh, thruster that uh, will, you know, it was ba it's basically built by one of NASA's astronauts. And it's going to take a uh, little jet of helium gas and, and microwave the hell out of it so it gets really hot. And it's going to use that for thrust. And the purpose of this is to cut down the amount of fuel that the station would need to stay in orbit. And this thing's going to be pushing, spritzing just a little bit all the time that'll keep the station uh, at a constant altitude. And it'll do a lot of good things. The reason why it's so important is that's the kind of engine that we would need to propel a spacecraft and a crew to someplace like Mars. Right now, chemical rockets burning the path that we need to fly in. It's going to take nine months to get to Mars. If we did it right with this kind of <clears throat> engine technology that we're on the verge of developing, it could be 60, 45 days. If, if, we, had, if we had that engine and enough power to drive it. And those are all things that I think we should be working on. So. Would, uh, would artificial gravity uh, help much? I mean, it sounds like there are a lot of uh, problems associated with being up there without gravity right now. And I was just wondering if, you know, how far have we gotten with artificial gravity? The, uh, the only way we know how to <coughs> create something like gravity is by accelerating, which generally means spinning something. So if we had a large vehicle that we rotated, or maybe two vehicles on a tether even, you could get a sense of gravity. Gravity in itself, as I would agree, <coughs> as far as we know, doesn't do anything positive for the human body. And, and the, the, the question is, can we develop protocols to deal with the negative things, or are we going to have to have some sort of artificial uh, acceleration that simulates gravity. Nobody knows. But again, without a space station, we're not going to get that answer. Yes, my question is, uh, how did your body adjust to the circadian rhythm um, differences between here and space? I, uh, I'm not sure that I'm the right guy to answer that because uh, it just seemed to me like our schedule up there was so hectic because we had to change our day to accommodate the shuttle's schedule. And we did that three times, and it was really hard to do that. Um, in space, we try and keep a 24-hour day like we do on Earth. We have a time zone that is the uh, Greenwich Meridian Time, or UMT. UTC, you know, it's the, the, the central meridian. And it's kind of a compromise between Houston time and Moscow time. And we get up at about 6.30 in the morning and go to bed 10 o'clock at night. And that, you know, that was our day. And it, it, it would match an Earth day, although we're going around about every 90 minutes. So we have a little over 15 sunrises and sunsets every day. <laughs> it's just something you get used to. I did not think it was a big deal, but... Uh, 
Young lady way in the back with a red striped shirt. Aside from the scientific, I, I'm very curious, what was it like to look down on the earth and think or feel that you were not necessarily a citizen there, but apart from it? It was pretty cool. I mean, I, I, I really thought, <laughs> you know, I thought we were really onto something here. Two quick stories on that. One was, when we got the laboratory up, and you saw in the video, we we're opening this big window up and looking down. Uh, Yuri Gidzenko, one of my crew members, had been, he was a colonel in the Russian Air Force. And he would look down, and he would say, OK, well, Shep, I was right here in the Black Sea, and this is my air base, and I, that's where my duty station was. I, I would sit in my MiG fighter and wait for the war to start. You know, that's what I did. <laughs> And I said, oh, yeah, well, well, here's a place I was as a Navy SEAL. You know, we're, we're chasing commies all over this part of the world. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, all kidding aside, it was in that moment that he and I kind of say, you know, whoa, that's all behind us now. You know, we're, we're doing something that's really different than that. And uh, it, really, it really drove that home, you know, just, just that aspect of the crew's relationship of uh, where they were and, what, you know, what we were doing. Uh, people ask me, you know, what did I enjoy the most about being in space? Somebody asked that, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> the thing that I enjoyed the most was early on in our space flight, we would, we would not have continuous communications because we had a radio that had to see a ground site. We weren't using satellites, so our communications were, you know, on for 15 minutes off for 25, then on for a little bit, then off for an hour. It was because we had these places around the world that we would have receivers we could talk to, and other places it would be three, four hours with silence. Get up in the morning, get your cup of coffee, Houston's on the line, and you're looking at your plan of the day, and they're saying, okay, at uh, 2 p.m., that activity that you're supposed to clean this thing, Scratch that, put something else in. I say, oh, okay, so we're, you know, drinking our coffee, writing that down. Okay, got it. 20 minutes later, we were over Moscow, and Moscow said, no, no, no. Don't do that thing Houston wants. <laughs> Two o'clock, we want you to do this other thing. <laughs> and uh, so uh, this happened a couple times, and I, I, I said, you know, what are they going to do, turn the radio off? So I... <laughs> I got on the horn one day, and I, I talked to Moscow, and I talked to Houston. I said, Eta blaha muha, and that means, that is bull crap in Russian. <laughs> and I said, look, you guys, we're not doing what is good for Houston or what's good for Moscow. We're one international space station, and we're going to do what's right for this station and this program. And you guys, you guys take a, take a step back and work it out and call me when you got that fixed. And that, that, that really made, that made my day. You know, holding on. <laughs> Two questions. One's real easy. What's the international, or what's the language up there that y'all spoke? And, and is it still going on? But the second question is, what was your greatest fear while you were up there? Two great questions. Uh, the first part, the language, we spoke... Russian for the most part <clears throat> in our first three months on orbit. Then Houston came online because we had our satellite link up and we went back and forth with Russian and English. And uh, that kind of relates to my greatest fear because uh, early on in the mission, we had these press events that were scheduled that you have to do. And so you're, in, you're floating in this module, and you're looking at a, ca a camera just on in the middle of the module. And I got Sir, Sergey and Yuri there. And I'm, you can hear in your headset this hubbub of people on the mic and whatnot. You're getting ready to fly over Europe and get piped into some press room in Russia. And there's going to be 50 reporters there. And they're going to ask you any crazy question that comes to mind in Russian. And it's all going to be on live TV downlink. And you better have a good answer. <laughs> I'll tell you, that was fear. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to add that one of the reasons why I am very interested in what's going on here at the IHMC is 
the language, we tried to make a big part of the station's language graphical, where you'd have diagrams and pictures of things that gave you inkling as to what, how the system worked, or what pipe things were in, or what valve to turn on and off. And that's still very much the protocol today. And I think that's one of the lessons of a multinational program is you've got to do that stuff. You know, maybe there is some more universal way to, to see complex things and understand them than just the verbal language. So it's a very important part of what we need to do in the future. Yeah. Sir. Scratch my head. No, the guy right behind you. What was your caloric intake like compared to uh, on Earth? And did they have to modify your protein, fats, and carbohydrates? And how did they determine your fluid needs? Great question. Uh, again, I'm probably not the best guy, but I'll tell you what I know. Um, the American space program had six or seven astronauts who flew on the Russian Mir station which is kind of a predecessor to International Space Station, and that started in 1992. Every one of those astronauts came back having some decrement in weight, body mass. And nobody could figure out why, and the astronauts got interviewed, and they said, well, we, just, we, we didn't have time to eat, or we didn't like the food, or something like that. So I was determined that that was not going to happen. I came back five pounds heavier than when I went up. <laughs> But uh, hydration is a big deal. Uh, the caloric intake was uh, around 2,000 calories a day minimum, probably more if you wanted it. But uh, keeping hydrated was a big issue. And, uh, sir. The uh, Russians currently have the only human rated bus going to the station. Uh, is the program sort of immune to the vagaries of what's going on now, you know, the p politics? Will it survive? It's a great, uh, great question. I, I don't understand the politics of the day. Um, I, I would hope it, it does survive. I can tell you that working astronaut to cosmonaut or engineer to engineer, it's a, it was really a good experience. And uh, I have every confidence that if we could keep the upper level management and the politics and the <laughs> diplomacy out of it, that would all continue probably better than ever. Um, all I can tell you is one quick story about, about how I see this. In uh, 1998, uh, a very prominent Russian who was the leader of cooperating with the US on space things <coughs> was a guy by the name of Vladimir Utkin, and he died. His counterpart was an Air Force general named Tom Stafford, and they had this commission. And this commission had worked for, gosh, six or seven years on how to, if you had two countries' space programs, how would you tie them together? And, you know, you, it's really, think of all the things that go into making, like, an automobile. You have materials. You know, what kind of metal is that? And how do you weld it? And what size fasteners do you use? And how does the radio talk to the, the button? And all the, I mean, thousands of things like that have to be coordinated. And this committee kind of started us down the road to do that. And uh, Utkin had a heart attack and died in 1998. And I went to his uh, wake, if you will, in the Kremlin. And it was a room, uh, big, dining hall, and they had hundreds of uh, senior Russian officials there. And uh, about 25 people got up and spoke about Utkin and his life. And uh, he had been uh, a, a seaman in World War II in the Russian Navy. And then he had worked on strategic missiles, and his last part of life was this commission that he was in charge of. And 25 guys got up, and they were all guys in their 60s and 70s and 80s. There was not a word, not a word, out of 27 mouths about anything to do with Utkin's cooperation with the West and, and the U.S. And I'm going, this is probably the most significant this thing, this thing that this guy did in his life. 
And not one of these guys has a word to say about it. So I reached the conclusion that nothing's going to change really at the top level in this strata in Russia till all those guys are in the ground. And I think that's still going on. It's not what the Russian people want, and it's not the reality of working one-on-one, -on -one, but it's, it's kind of how they're managed. And I, I just hope we can get past this. Maybe a question right behind you. Sir. Yes, sir. With all the uh, space debris that we have, uh, obviously, in orbit, can you please touch on some of the concerns during your four and a half month mission uh, in terms of avoiding some of the space debris? And, and I guess the second part of that is uh, if you had an occurrence of that, can you just lightly discuss the procedures at the International Space Station, the precautions? First of all, uh, space debris, how big a problem is it? Um, it's kind of like the big sky theory. You know, there's lots of room up there. And uh, if you look at how much space material there is to run into, um, there's not so much really big stuff. And there's a lot of little things like paint flakes out there. So the, the distribution, if you will, is uh, the smaller things get, there's lots more of them. So there's a way that we use radar looking at the horizon to see the big chunks. So we can see really big stuff down to about maybe grapefruit size things, depending upon what it's made of and how its aspect is to the radar. And we track that stuff. And there's not enough of it so that we don't have days or even weeks sometime of heads up that we're going to get close to one of these things. And we can maneuver a little bit to get around it. The smaller stuff, the paint flakes, the little chips of metal and whatnot, we have armor on the outside of the space station's modules sufficient that you could take uh, things down to small ball bearings or BBs into the armor and the armor will protect it. So what you're worried about is kind of like the golf balls to the grapefruit. And we think that the number of those, I and mean, they did a big study when they designed the station, they said the chance of you smacking one of those things is like once every couple of hundred years. Well, if it happens to be next year, that's a bad year. <laughs> but in terms of probability and risk and all that, it's way better than getting on a commercial airliner and going somewhere. I mean, the odds that you would not get to the other end of your destination in one piece are, are way worse than what I just described. So it's just it's a balance. Having uh, the Chinese smoking some objects in low Earth orbit is not helping. And if we have much more of that, then it could be, you know, it, it ups the, the density of what's up there. We, we do have to watch it. We do have treaties that regulate it. Uh, just following them is a problem. One more question. Somebody in the back. We haven't heard from the back there all, all night. Okay. Way in the back. Uh, with insulation and uh, on the shuttle, I mean, excuse me, the uh, space station and air conditioning, uh, do you have to worry about humidity and or too, being too dry, the air conditioning? Now, the, uh, the problem that we have, uh, we, 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 one of the bigger purposes of the air conditioning system is to take the moisture out of the air. Humans expel uh, humid exhaust, and so... If you don't uh, squeeze that out when you're running through the uh, air conditioning, it's going to start condensing on things, which is bad for electronics and a few other things. We try and keep the humidity fairly low, like 30%, 40%, somewhere in there. Um, but managing the heating and cooling, uh, again, the US has a fairly uh, kind of, uh, well, the Russians do it really smartly. They have. When you're up in space, you have one side of the vehicle that gets hot and the other side that gets cold. And the Russians have radiators and pumps. They just move fluid around. So if they want to get colder, they move cold fluid. And if they want to get hotter, they move hot fluid. It's really ingenious. Ours, we have a much more sophisticated system that's not as energy efficient. And it works, but it's just a different approach. <laughs>